Just before we get started with today's video, I do want to thank Brilliant for sponsoring it. To support today, I found out and learn more about Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash brainfood and sign up for free. Only nine months after the near disaster of Apollo 13, NASA decided to try again with Apollo 14. For the mission, three astronauts were chosen. Edgar Mitchell, Alan Shepard, and Stuart A. Rusa. Shepard's had already earned international fame for being the first American and second human overall in space, which he did in 1961. Funnily enough, during this flight, he was soaking in his own urine due to delays in the launch and no bathroom being available. Mitchell and Rusa were both accomplished pilots and engineers. Important to the topic at hand is that years before any of this, in 1953, Rusa took a summer job as a smoke jumper for the US Forest Service. It was because of this connection that, when it was announced that he'd be a member of the Apollo 14 crew, that he was approached with an interesting proposal. Ed Cliff, the chief of the Forest Service, called Rusa and asked if he'd be willing to take a metal canister filled with 500 seeds aboard Apollo 14. The seeds in question consisted of Douglas fir, sequoia, sycamore, sweetgum, and loblolly pine. Stan Krugman, who worked at the U.S. Forest Service and was put in charge of selecting the seeds, noted, I picked redwoods because they were well known, and the others because they would grow well in many parts of the United States. The seeds came from two Forest Service genetic institutes. In most cases, we knew their parents, a key requirement for any post-flight genetic studies. On that note, a group of control seeds were also kept back on Earth to compare with. Besides being great publicity, the hope was to use these seeds to study how trees would grow back on Earth after being exposed to space travel. Krugman noted, The scientists wanted to find out what would happen to these seeds if they took a ride to the moon. Would they sprout? Would the trees look normal? We also wanted to give them away as part of the U.S. Bicentennial celebration in 1976. As each astronaut was allowed to carry with them a personal preference kit, essentially just a small number of personal items, and the seeds were otherwise innocuous, NASA officials gave the idea their blessing, and Rusa agreed to take them along for the ride. In the end, the seeds orbited the moon 34 times in the command module Kitty Hawk at the same time Shepard was on the lunar surface, taking chip shots with a couple of his personal items golf balls. On February the 9th, 1971, Apollo 14 splashed down in the South Pacific Ocean with neither the drama nor the danger of Apollo 13. Unfortunately, during the decontamination process back on Earth, the seed-holding metal canister burst open when exposed to a near-vacuum environment, scattering all of the seeds. Krugman classified the seeds as being traumatized, and it was speculated that the exposure to the extreme low pressure may have killed any chance of the seeds germinating. But after careful separation and cleaning, they were planted anyway, and almost all of them grew. Over the next few years, the saplings were distributed across the world, though most went to places in the United States, particularly near state capitol buildings, where they were often planted in conjunction with 1975 and 1976's bicentennial celebrations. One was planted in Washington Square in Philadelphia, another at a Girl Scout camp in Indiana, and another one in a Boise, Idaho elementary school. A few went to New Orleans at the request of the city's mayor, who was nicknamed Moon. Yet another was sent to the Siskiyou Smoke Jumpers base in Oregon, near where Rusa had briefly worked a couple of decades before. A moon tree was also planted in front of the White House with President Gerald Ford calling the trees living symbols of our spectacular human and scientific achievements. Beyond that, one was given to the Emperor of Japan, Hirohito, as well as sent to various countries where official requests were made. In fact, the number of groups wanting moon trees was so great that they ended up taking cuttings from the remaining moon trees to make so-called half-moon or second-generation moon trees to give out. After the initial hoopla, however, the moon trees were mostly forgotten. This was partially due to the fact that the trees grew just like every other tree, just as swiftly and with the same coloring as any old earthbound tree. In some cases, the control trees were even grown next to moon trees with no significant difference between them, other than that some are marked by a plaque noting their historic significance. Unfortunately, nobody bothered to keep a list of where all the moon trees were sent and planted. To try and rectify the issue of the missing moon trees, in the mid-1990s, NASA astronomer Dave Williams went looking for them, and he put together a database to keep track of the ones that he found. It turns out many were not marked, and therefore were growing with almost nobody seeming to realize what they were, including one right outside of Williams' office at the Goddard Space Center in Maryland. He stated in 2002, I had no idea it was there. As of the making of this video, the database currently has 77 trees documented. Williams also found several trees that are no longer with us due to being victims of hurricanes. Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, as well as development. Several moon trees were bulldozed without anyone realizing their significance at the time. 
Obviously, with 500 original seeds, not to mention the many cuttings taken from them, and only 77 trees currently known, there are likely hundreds of moon trees still out there, along with many more made from cuttings of the originals. On that note, one of these second-generation moon trees was planted in 2005 at the Arlington National Cemetery near the grave of Rusa, who died about a decade earlier. Nearby is a plaque that reads, In honor of Apollo astronaut Stuart A. Rusa and the other distinguished astronauts who have departed our presence here on Earth. It is noteworthy that given there are only 12 people alive today that have been to the moon, four remaining who have walked on it, and all of whom are over the age of 82, if we don't go back to the moon soon, these trees will be the only living things left on Earth that have been to the moon, even if only orbiting. As for one of Rusa's sons, Jack, he notes, these trees will be here a hundred years from now. By then, I believe we'll be planting Mars trees right beside them. And here's hoping. So today's video has been a sort of meeting of biology and physics, and if you enjoy both of those subjects, then I think you'll really enjoy the content of today's sponsor, Brilliant. You've heard me talk about Brilliant before. They're a learning platform that focuses on active learning. This is where you're given a short bit of information on a scientific concept, and then you're asked to solve a problem based on that information. This is called active learning, and it's an incredibly effective way to learn. So as well as having excellent courses going really into depth, Brilliant also have something for those of us who are a bit more time-strapped. They're called daily challenges, and they're just five minutes a day that you can use to exercise your brain and learn something new. Maybe on your commute or wherever you are, and did Brilliant now has offline mode so you can take those problems around with you even if you've got a spotty internet connection. With daily challenges, thousands of people have learned whether they weigh more in Helsinki or Mexico, they've calculated the area of a snowflake, and they've even used expected value to decide whether to play a grifter's game. Each problem provides you with the context and the framework that you need to tackle it. This means that you can learn concepts by applying them. That's that active learning thing. This sort of short daily practice can lead you from curiosity to mastery in far less time than you would think. So just go to brilliant.org forward slash brain food and finish your day a little smarter. The first 200 of you to do that will get 20% off your annual subscription and you'll be able to view all of the problems in the archives. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.